Hi, welcome back. In this session, I'd like to take on a concept that has acquired a lot of followers among corporates, among investors, among consultants, and that's ESG. Everybody's caught up in it. And I have to tell you up front that I come from a position of skepticism when people claim to have found something new and revolutionary in corporate finance and business. I've seen over the last three decades, I've seen people take concepts that are straightforward and simple, that are part of the corporate finance lexicon, add a couple of proprietary twists to it, add put an acronym on the name, and then market it. Market it to the point where you can overcharge for the concept and tell everybody that this is the magic bullet that's going to solve every one of your problems. And with every one of these concepts, about a decade after the concept has been introduced and sold, here's what happens. The truth comes out and people abandon the concept, but people have become rich along the way. Consultants, experts, services that offer. So when ESG came along, the big question was, is this another in a long line of overmarketed concepts? Now, you could argue that ESG, in a sense, is different. Its promise is wider and bigger than just saying businesses will be better with ESG. It's about making society better. And therein may lie a problem in how ESG is being tested and debated. Let me explain. First, let's talk about timing. Why now? Why talk about ESG now? In a sense, the stars all aligned last week for talking about ESG. In what sense? Well, it's been 50 years since one of the most influential op-eds in the New York Times has been published, an op-ed written by Milton Friedman, where he said, the objective of a business that companies should focus on profitability and value, not on delivering on a social mission. That was 50 years ago. So the 50th anniversary, of course, the New York Times gathered together a list of luminaries, and they all opined on the Friedman op-ed to a person, every single one of them. These included academics, economists, um, you know, social, you know, uh, 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 social commentator. And they all said, well, Friedman was wrong. The world has moved on. And it's a good time then to examine whether Milton Friedman was really off the table in terms of the recommendations he made. The second was, especially in the context of COVID, there have been people who've argued that ESG companies, companies that are good, socially conscious, have weathered this crisis much better than companies that are not. It's now become part of the accepted wisdom. It's been pushed by both, not just academics, but by investors like BlackRock, claiming that ESG stocks have done better than the market. And thirdly, there's a longer standing story of how ESG has become part of companies. In fact, there are multiple services that measure ESG and you see ESG becoming part of what investors are looking at on companies more and more. Now, before we go on, it should be it's worth noting that ESG is now the establishment. The establishment has clearly bought it. And let me explain. Last year, the conference board composed of CEOs of some of the largest companies in the U.S., put out a statement that the objective of a company is to take care of its stakeholders. I have no problem with that. That's absolutely you know, in, unimpeachable. That's a statement companies should make. But they went further. They said that when you run a company, you should have multiple objectives. You should take care of every stakeholder's interest. And I wrote about this last year. So many CEOs also seem to have bought in the notion that this is now part of their mission to play a role in society. Investors seem to have bought in as well. Prominently, Larry Fink of BlackRock has become a vocal proponent of ESG, arguing that for investors, it's good if companies operate in society's best interest. Academics seem to have bought in as well. In many business schools now, you have you know, groups that take care of, you know, talk about ESG, teach ESG, and it's become almost part of accepted wisdom that being good as a company will also deliver good results, make you more profitable, more valuable, and at the same time, make investors better off. Everybody seems to be better off. And best of all, while doing this, you're also improving society. Now, here's the problem. Though. The services that measure ESG have an issue. The issue is, unlike financial measures, where there are dollar values you can look at, ESG is based on qualitative, fuzzy measures. Now, that by itself would not be an issue because fuzzy measures have been measured, you know, have had numbers attached to them before. These fuzzy measures, there's no consensus in terms of ranking. What's, what should be important, what shouldn't. Let me give you a very simple example. If you're a very, very, very strong environmentalist, to you, the worst company in the world might be Aramco. Why? Because it brings oil out of the ground. It contributes to global warming, climate change. But your neighbor who's much more concerned about privacy and politics might view Facebook as the devil incarnate. 
In other words, there is no consensus here on rankings and the services truck, they do try to put numbers on, on the different qualities they bring in. But guess what? Because there is no consensus, the correlation in ESG rankings across services is low. So if you look at the top 100 companies, best companies on one services list and the top 100 companies in the second, there's almost no consensus. There's, 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 there's correlation, but not very strong correlation. You're saying that's because there are companies which are lower profile. Maybe that's what they disagree on. In fact, in one study, uh, you know, it looked at you know, high, high profile companies, companies like Facebook and Walmart and noted how much of a divergence there was between three different services. And these are all mainline services measuring corporate governance. So even if we agree that corporate governance measures, measuring corporate governance is going to be a problem simply because of what you're trying to measure. Now, there are some defenders of corporate ESG who claim that this is just an, a maturing process, that as ESG matures as a concept, there will be consensus that services will tend to agree more. I don't believe it for a moment. And here's why. If you truly have consensus on something being good or bad, you don't have to have ESG. Companies will do it. The very fact that you have to lecture companies on what makes them good companies tells us that there is divergence of opinion out there and that divergence of opinion will continue. But even if you get past that problem, there's one final issue. The way we measure ESG is we look at what companies do. But let's suppose that what we look at is easier for companies, some companies to do than others. Let me not be mysterious. Let's suppose we look at how much companies spend on being socially conscious, how much they give back to society, you know, how much time they give off for their employees to play social roles. You know what? Companies that are doing well have an easier time doing that than companies on the edge. So if you measure ESG based on actions that are easier for profitable and more successful companies to take on, you create a causation problem. What am I talking about? When you say that companies that rank high on ESG are more profitable, do better than companies that are not. Is it because companies that are that are that rank high on ESG are doing better, or is it because companies that are doing better find it easier to deliver those measures that make them look good on ESG? It's something that's that's bedeviled research. You will come back and talk about it. But the ESG promises are what I think has made this train catch the speed that it has, and it promises everything to everybody. To, corporate, to corporates, to CEOs and CFOs, the ESG promises if you're a good company, and let's, let's for the moment accept that somehow we figured out what good actually means on the goodness, badness scale. If you're a good company, you will become more profitable, perhaps not in the short term, but in the long term, and be a more valuable business, perhaps even less risky. So companies are better off from adopting ESG. To investors, the ESG promises if you invest in companies that rank higher in ESG, you can earn higher returns. And to society, the promise is if companies are socially good, if they do well on ESG, society overall is going to be better off. Now, who can fight this concept? It's everything for everybody. It's all good things to all people. So I'm going to step back and argue that to address ESG honestly, you got to look at three separate questions. The first is, how does ESG play out in value? Because ESG could increase value. And at the risk of, uh, of, 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 of killing some sacred cows, it could decrease value, could do nothing for value. How does ESG play out value? That's the first question. The second question is, what do markets price in when they look at companies? Do they give higher ESG companies higher pricing? A separate issue from valuation because this is a market perspective. And there's a third question. How do investors get rewarded or punished based on ESG? How does ESG affect value? How do markets price it in? How are investors affected? You're saying, why is three separate questions? Because let me play out a couple of scenarios. It is possible that ESG is good for value, that if you're a company, your value increases by 10% by being more socially conscious, by being a better company. Let's say that's true. But let's say markets overreact to your goodness. They push up the price by 15% instead sort of 10%. Do you see where I'm going? ESG is good for value. Your pricing has gone up. But if investors buy your stock at that higher price, they will get lower returns. So even though ESG is good for companies and it's priced in because it's overpriced, you're going to get returns that are bad for investors and good companies. 
We need to separate these questions. And one of the problems that I see with the ESG research is the questions seem to be muddled. When people look at returns to investing in good companies and they discover, for instance, that returns are higher investing in good companies, they jump to the conclusion that this must mean that ESG is good for value. Not necessarily. So let's start with the question of ESG and value. Now, in a sense, we're operating on a domain where I feel very comfortable. Now, we know what drives the value of a company. It's driven by cash flows and risk. And I'm not talking about putting any structure on a risk and return model. It's basic common sense. What are cash flows driven by? They're driven by a capacity to grow revenues. What your margins are, how profitable your business model is, and how much you reinvest to get that growth. And what's your risk going, where's your risk going to show up? It first shows up as what it costs you to raise equity, a cost of equity, and what it costs you to borrow money. So I'm going to state a proposition that I find incredibly useful when dealing with these acronyms, the buzzwords that get thrown on us. It's called the it proposition. If it does not affect the cash flows and it does not affect risk, it cannot affect value. You see, what are you talking about? It? What's it? You name it. It's, it could be something as uh, precise as do acquisitions affect value? But in the case of ESG, the question is, does ESG affect value? Here's the it proposition on ESG. If ESG is going to affect value, it has to either show up as higher cash flows or a lower required rate of return or a lower funding cost. Now, you can have your own story as to why that will happen, but that's where it's going to show up. So I'm going to give you three scenarios linking ESG to value. Since ESG is a, is a religion to some, I'm going to use some biblical references here. The first scenario is where the good are rewarded. Think of this, if you're, if you're a Christian, as a New Testament God, a, a God who rewards goodness. Good companies get rewarded. In what way? Well, good companies produce products. Consumers buy more of their products, are willing to pay higher prices because these companies are good. So it shows up as higher revenue growth, higher margins. And because they have more, more sustainable business models, their reinvestment is lower. And as a consequence of it being lower, they can reinvest less to deliver the same growth. Higher growth, higher margins, lower reinvestment, higher cash flows. And because these companies are good, they also benefit in another way. Investors are willing to invest in these companies because they're good companies and demand a lower rate of return. So they have a lower cost of raising equity and lenders lend to them and feel less worried about bad things. The companies will do and charge them a lower interest rate. So funding costs are lower. And because these companies are good, they avoid those disasters and catastrophes that seem to be, that seem to kind of get in the way of bad companies. So in this scenario, Good companies get rewarded. So goodness delivers its own reward. For ESG advocates, this is your best possible scenario because you can go to CEOs and say, well, just be good. And over time, everything's going to come up roses. There's a second scenario and staying with the biblical, uh, the biblical terminology. Think of this as an Old Testament God, a vengeful God. Here, the bad companies get punished. In what way? Consumers stop buying their products and services. They have lower revenue growth. They have to charge lower prices. They have lower margins. And often because employees don't stay on, suppliers are, are reluctant to, to interact with them. They have investment models that require more reinvestment. So they have lower cash flows. In addition, in the market, investors avoid their shares. What does that mean? Pushes up their cost of equity. So funding costs go up for equity. Bankers are more reluctant to lend to them, so they have higher costs of debt. And overall, it translates into higher funding costs. And to add some spice to the mix, because these companies flirt on the edge of disaster, they're bad companies, they're more likely to get into catastrophes, disasters. So in this scenario, bad companies get punished. It's still good for the ESG advocates, but not as good as the first scenario, because here, when you make a sales pitch to companies, it is, don't be bad. Because that's where the punishment is. You can't tell them to be good because there's no payoff to being good, but there's a punishment to being bad. But still, ESG advocates should take this because there's a third scenario where if you're a religious person, this is your hell on earth. Here, the bad guys win. In what way? Bad companies have lower costs. Why? Because they put their factories, they use underage labor, whatever you want to make this this, uh, uh, your description of a bad company. The lower cost, they get higher margins, they charge lower prices, they get higher growth, 
They might be able to reinvest less because they reinvest in parts of the world where there are very few regulatory and environmental constraints. They might actually have higher cash flows. And because of higher growth and higher cash flows, equity investors might actually like their companies, like their shares, and which gives them a lower cost of equity and a higher stock price. And they might be able to borrow money based on their cash flows. So in this scenario, bad companies get rewarded at the expense of good companies. You say that can't be. Hey, this is an empirical question, not a moralistic question. I'm not asking which would you like to see. The question is, what is the truth? So let's look at the evidence on ESG and value. And if you look at the evidence in ESG and value, I'm going to break it up into three parts. The link between ESG and profitability has been examined in hundreds of studies of varying quality. And here's the bottom line. If there's a link found, it's a weak link between being good and being profitable. A weak link. And that weak link is very sensitive to how you define profitability, the sample size you use and the time period you look at. So the over, if you're asking for an overall consensus, there's a very weak link between being good and being profitable. There's a stronger link between ESG and cost of funding, but on the bad company side. Put simply, the studies of sin stocks, what are sin stocks, casino companies, tobacco companies, increasingly fossil fuel companies, have found that these companies are charge a higher cost for investors. Why? Because there are many investors don't want to invest in them. But there's a catch to the story. Bad companies face higher costs of equity. But the flip side of the story is investors in these bad companies actually earn higher returns. And there's a third piece to the evidence. And, there, and on this, there, the evidence is fairly light right now. But there is some evidence that if you're a bad company, there's a greater chance of catastrophic and disaster risk. And your stock returns reflect that. So the evidence is weak on the link between ESG and profitability, stronger on the risk measures. So if I were to summarize the evidence, it is the evidence seems to suggest don't be a bad company. But he says, should I be a good company? Should I spend more? And the evidence is not there yet. Let's look at ESG and returns. Yeah. Now, let's start with a basic reality that ESG advocates need to confront you know, directly. If you are optimizing, I mean, if you've ever done you know, you know, operations research and you're doing an optimization problem, a constrained optimal can never deliver a result which is better than an unconstrained optimal. What are you talking about? And let's suppose you took every listed stock in the US and you were able to invest in all of them because you have no ESG constraints. There is no way you can tell me, ex ante, that removing 25% of these stocks because they're bad companies and making my universe smaller makes me better off. I mean, you could make, I might be just as well off, but I can't be better off. That is a fundamental fact that you've got to deal with up front. And there are very few ESG funds that seem to be honest about this truth. Just as an example, one fund that seems to tell the truth, I am part of the TIA Craft Fund as part of, as, as a professor at a university. That is my pet. That's where my money gets invested. And they offer, re and, and, and going with the fact that ESG is now this bandwagon effect, they've offered what's called a social choice equity fund to all people investing. And that social choice equity fund invests only in good companies, with quotes around the word good. And in um, 2017, a year in which that fund delivered lower returns in their benchmark fund, they were pretty open about it. They said, that's because in this fund, we avoid bad companies. And if you remove stocks from our universe, it makes us worse off. That's truth in advertising. I would have more respect for ESG funds if they said that up front. Because there is an internal contradiction here in the ESG story. If you tell CEOs and CFOs that being good lowers your funding costs, you cannot in the same breath tell investors in those companies that being good delivers higher returns to them. So when you look at returns in ESG, they're very tough to read because showing that ESG and good returns go together tells me very little. And here's why. ESG can increase value, decrease value, do nothing for value. You can make positive returns, negative returns, or no returns from ESG. But there's an intervening variable, which is what's the market pricing in? And when you tell me the returns you generate from investing in good stocks, without bringing in what the market is doing, I have a very tough time going from there to whether ESG is good or bad for value. As an example, let's assume that ESG is bad for value. It reduces value. But let's assume that markets 
underreact. Underreact in what sense? They, you know, when ESG is bad for value, markets don't drop by enough to reflect that badness. So what do you do? You buy those companies. You will actually make positive returns even though ESG is bad for value. You're betting on what the market is doing. In other words, returns reflect market prices relative to expectations. So when you look at a study on returns, you should expect that confusion to play out. And it does. And here's how it plays out. If you look at the studies that link ESG to returns, they're all over the place. Some studies find that ESG and returns go together, that investing in good companies deliver higher returns. Now, some studies find the opposite, that investing in bad stocks deliver higher returns, sin stocks deliver higher returns. And some studies are kind of neutral. They argue that, you know, it depends on which period you look at and how you screen your portfolio. And even those studies that find ESG and returns are positively related, they also find that ESG tends to be correlated with two factors of long standing. One is momentum and the other is growth. You see, what are you talking about? Companies that rank high on ESG, if you look at the last 20 or 30 years and service rankings ESG, companies that rank high on ESG also tend to be companies with high momentum that have gone up the most in recent periods and high growth companies. And that's why a disproportionately large number of companies in ESG funds tend to be tech companies. So if you correct for those factors and you put ESG into the mix, it's questionable whether ESG is what's delivering the returns or whether it's momentum and growth. So I'm going to offer you some glimmers of hope if you're still hoping to make money in ESG. There are two scenarios where ESG might deliver higher returns. The first is a scenario where there's a transition period. Let me explain. Let's assume that good companies actually increase value, but markets are slow in reflecting that. In that transition period, what you will have is value will increase up front, but markets will slowly catch up. And in the transition period, you're going to make higher returns investing in good companies. The intervening variable, the market, is doing something, a mistake that you're taking advantage of. So in this story, if you can get ahead of the game, invest in companies that are good, where you believe that goodness increases value and you back it up, but markets are slow in adjusting, you take advantage of the slow moving market. Here's the second potential scenario. Is it is possible that ESG, for the most part, doesn't show up in your cash flows and your discount rates, but companies that are bad have more catastrophic risk. So you don't see it very often when it happens, it blows up your company. Maybe investing in ESG reduces that downside risk, which should make ESG companies better investments during crises. So what's the investing lesson here? There's no easy way to make money on ESG. If you pick stocks that are ranked high on ESG, don't expect to be rewarded for it. Everybody can see the ESG. If there is a payoff to ESG, it must be from being dynamic, from sensing things that markets are going to price in three, four, five years ahead of them pricing it in, buying those companies and waiting patiently for it to happen. There are no easy ways to make money. Why should ESG be any exception? Now, of course, with COVID in place, you have a test of are ESG stocks better during a crisis? And at least initially, the conclusion seemed to be that ESG companies were doing much better. In fact, at one level, it's not debatable. ESG companies have benefited from this crisis in terms of how much money has flowed into them. This is fun flow into ESG stocks during the crisis. Clearly, money has flowed into ESG stocks. For better or worse, investors have pushed money into ESG stocks. But remember... ESG stocks are also often tech stocks, momentum stocks, growth stocks. So whether it's ESG or momentum and growth that's driving this fund flow, we don't know. In fact, to back this up of ESG stocks doing well, Morningstar looks at ESG funds and has noted that during this crisis, ESG funds have done disproportionately well. The way to see this is to see how many of them rank in the top quartile. And remember, if it's random, it should be 25% in each quartile. But that's not what you see. The best ESG fund, the ESG funds overall say, are more likely to show up in the first quartile than the fourth, fourth quartile. So you think this is good? ESG must be what's creating these returns. It's good to invest in ESG stocks during the crisis. Well, not so fast. A recent paper that looked at ESG at, at this phenomenon during the crisis and corrected for the fact that you have growth and momentum stocks found that ESG by itself was not adding anything to the returns. In fact, this study found that in the first quarter of 2020, which was when markets were melting down, ESG was a neutral factor. 
It did nothing. It didn't add because what was creating the returns was momentum and growth. And in the second quarter, when stocks came back, ESG act, act, uh, actually acted as a net negative. So has COVID made ES, the ESG story stronger? Well, not quite yet. So if you're doing victory dances in the end zone because how ESG has performed, stop. So what's the bottom line? Well, I think in many circles, ESG has become this good. Everybody's supposed to accept it because arguing against it is viewed as a sign of moral deficiency. And I think that's getting in the way of an honest argument about ESG. Much of the research in ESG has been sloppy and agenda driven, where people start off with the premise that this is a good thing and that your job as a researcher is to show it's a good thing. That's not what research is supposed to be. And the more I read the ESG research, the more I'm inclined to go back to Milton Friedman. Because whether you agree with him or disagree with him, his argument comes from a position of coherence and consistency. So we're going to displace the Friedman view that companies should first and foremost be custodians of shareholder wealth and profitability and financial health. And if you're going to be good, you first have to deliver on that then I think we need to see more solid evidence to the contrary. And I haven't seen it yet. I, uh, no, I, I know we all, I, uh, I know at this point you're probably saying you, you're ethically challenged, you're morally deficient. I'm okay with those arguments, uh, with, the, uh, with those critiques, because I think we share a common objective. We want companies to act in the best interest of society. We all do. The question is, how do we get them to do it? My view is ESG as marketed now is on a dangerous path because a decade from now, I will make a prediction that more companies than ever before will be on the ESG bandwagon, but they will be no more socially responsible than companies today or companies 30 years ago, 50 years ago. A lot of people have been enriched, mostly consultants, experts and ESG advocates. But society overall will be worse off because what you will have are companies that posture. I, for one, don't want to hear platitudes from CEOs and how good they are and how well their companies are behaving. I want actions. And I want those actions to be consistent with financial health. If we want companies to be socially responsible, we have to make it in their financial best interest to be socially responsible. And guess where that responsibility ultimately lies? It lies with you and I. In what way? If we want companies to be socially responsible, we have to put money behind those words. We have to buy products of companies that we think of as good companies and be willing to pay more for those products. We have to invest in shares of companies that are socially responsible and accept the fact that we accept we will get lower returns on those companies. If we do that, then companies will become socially responsible. If on the other hand, we want to have our cake and eat it too, then all we will have are companies that sound good but don't do good. I hope you found the session useful and thank you very much for listening.